that, um, Harvey, if you want to make a quick intro for Craig for any new members that have come on. That Great. Be yeah, thanks. Uh, just, just real quickly, I'm Harvey Briggs. I'm the communications director at Forest Wealth. I also run the automotive website Rides and Drives. Uh, and so I'm really excited to be a part of this and helping to bring these uh, great speakers to everyone here. Uh, Craig Irwin is uh, with Roth Capital and he is going to take it away and ask questions of our panelists. I'm going to get out of the way because they're much more important than I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Isabel, if you could stop sharing the screen, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so just to get this out of the way, because um, all of you know I'm a research analyst, a cell site analyst, and issue recommendations, I have an obligation um, to cover my disclosures. So uh, those are Roth makes a market and shares with Arkimoto, Blink Canoe, and Electromechanical Vehicles Corp. As such, the firm buys and sells from customers on a principal basis. Also, within the last 12 months, Roth has, Roth has received compensation for investment banking from Arkimoto, Electromechanica, and Blink. Um, and within the last 12 months, Roth has managed or co-managed public offerings for Arkimoto and Blink Charging. Um, with that today, um, we have an exciting panel. This is a great panel because it includes everything from software to hardware um, to assets. Um, there is a really interesting um, cross section of the different technology going into the infrastructure side of the equation. And as most of the uh, 1,100 attendees will know, you can't have EV growth without the infrastructure growth. And you know that's why this group is, is um, really important and really exciting for the future of the industry. So we've um, got some scripted questions. Um, I'm gonna run through those uh, with everybody. Um, and uh, you know, I, I encourage you, if you have direct questions, to reach out to the IR representatives of each company or obviously Roth um, clients can reach out to me. Or if you're from the PE or VC world, just ping me, it's, you know, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, and we're gonna follow the order um, that is in the, in the slides. So I'm gonna start off with uh, Lu Kong. If, if you could give us, um, uh, sorry, with Bao Min, can you give us a brief introduction to your company? What do you do? What are you focusing on? And what's a, unique to your platform or approach? Hi, uh, hi, hello everyone. It's a great pleasure to attend the panel and have this discussion. And Lu Kong is a company and we are focusing on a spatial temporal data processing technologies. We provide services in 2D and 3D maps, especially HD maps, which are widely used for advanced driver assistance systems and autonomous driving. And the latest growth of autonomous driving is largely driven by electronic vehicles. And we have patented uh, super engine technology in data processing that in certain scenarios a uh, thousand times faster than our competitors. So we acquired EMAP Go in 2019 to combine the strength, our data processing technology and the HD map production technology. And EMAP Go is the 2020 global globe, global, uh, Golden Globe Award winner. So in the HD map category, in the smart, autonomous annual conference in China. It is a recognized leader in HD map production and servicing. And it is among the top four in the HD map space in terms of market share in 2019, according to IDC Consulting. And Baidu, uh, Navi, Info, Alibaba are the other three. And we are the only public company traded on US stock market accessible to US investors uh, if you want to take advantage directly in the rapid growth of the HD map sector in China. Baidu and Alibaba have their uh, stock listed in US market, but their share of my business is minuscule to their uh, revenue contribution. So compared to their main businesses, uh, they are in a search and e-commerce, which much, much, much larger. And uh, NavInfo is only listed on China's uh, Shanghai uh, Stock Exchange. So it's not available in US. So if you really want to bet long 
on the HD map growth in China, driven largely by the EV growth. And we are the only game in town. So please come and play. Excellent. So I just want to make sure I heard this correctly, right? Number three in HD maps in China and number four globally. I mean, we all know Apple Maps and uh, obviously Waze, but you, you're, no, you're, you're number three in China and number four globally. Is that, is that correct? So uh, we mainly uh, do our business in China. So uh, our, our market share, our calculation is based on the China. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Alf. Can you give us a quick uh, intro to Ideanomics? Um, I know you do several things, but um, can you talk about you know what you're doing and, and what differentiates you out there in, in the infrastructure world? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for having us on, Craig. Good to see you, my friend. And same with you, Harvey, as well. Um, Ideanomics is somewhat unique because we offer a range of products and services across the EV ecosystem. Um, we really have two sides to our business. The first side is a service side. That's our MEG group. Um, we have a, a division there that, that really is a guiding rail for fleet operators looking to, to move into EV. Uh, we offer a sales to financing to charging model that I've spoken about on, on many calls like this many times. The idea is to help people quickly and efficiently at the fleet level get into vehicles at the right, the right model, the right price, and, and help them understand which charging products are best. Um, we also have a really exciting product division um, that's headed up by our Medici Motor Works. Those are the vehicles that we're bringing now to the US. Uh, we obviously have Tree Electric, which is our two-wheeler brand out of Malaysia. We'll also bring, be bringing those vehicles. Um, we've recently um, uh, done an acquisition of a wireless charging company out of Utah called Wave. Obviously, Wave is going to be providing the inductive charging for those heavy trucks and buses we're going to be selling through Medici in this country. And uh, we also have an investment in um, Selectrack, which is obviously in the in the EV tractor space. So it's safe to say we're, we're working right the way across the breadth of the EV industry. Excellent, excellent. Um, Michael, do you wanna maybe give us a quick, uh, quick intro to, uh, to Blink? Um, what's unique, what's your, what's your platform and approach? Yes, uh, good day, um, thank you for having me here. Um, Blink is an owner and operator of EV charging infrastructure. Um, our business is to uh, fuel EVs, provide the fuel, which is electricity, um, wherever their cars are, are um, standing still, whether it's at uh, home, multifamily, single family, um, retail, um, office parks, hospitals, municipalities, um, even on the streets in, in, in different areas. Um, but uh, we're, we're basically the, the fueling centers of the future and, and we own and operate them. In addition, we provide hardware um, that we, we design and manufacture and we have a network, um, the Blink network that operates all of the charging stations. But our, our main business really, and, and all those are ancillary, our main business is fueling um, EVs. Excellent, excellent. So Desmond, your, your business is fueling EVs, but you've got a, you've got a different model. Can, can you maybe give us an intro to Beam and, and talk about what you do different? Well, actually, I think it'd probably be more accurate to say that we charge or we fuel the EV charger. Um, so um, we, we support uh, Mike's excellent business and uh, frankly, everybody else that's been on this panel and the one that was on earlier on this morning. Um, I listened to that panel and what was clear from that was that there's going to be a tremendous growth in electric vehicles uh, in the future. That means that we're going to require a massive amount of EV charging infrastructure. We manufacture renewably energized EV charger infrastructure products. So we're not in the EV charging space. We don't compete with Mike at, at Blink or ChargePoint or any of the others. In fact, we enable them. Uh, and we have their chargers uh, factory installed on our products and shipped to our customers uh, so they can be, be deployed rapidly, uh, scalably, and uh, very uh, robustly. So we're a San Diego-based sustainable technology innovation company. We, we focus on three market verticals. EV charging infrastructure is certainly the biggest and the most important and the fastest growing, uh, but we also play in energy security. Uh, we make a very reliable source of electricity that's uh, immune to blackouts and brownouts. And then also an outdoor media where we use outdoor media sales to uh, fund the deployment of larger volumes of our products. So just here to support everybody, frankly, and we, what we like about the business model is that because we're not uh, specific to the charger or the service provider, um, we, we're, we're, we we rise with everybody and uh, we look forward to that. Excellent, excellent. Gregory, one of your partners gave you a little shout out on the uh, on the prior session, sort of a soft shout out, I should say. <laughs> um, 
can you give us a quick intro to Nuvi and, and what you're doing different? I know it's real different um, versus what people conventionally think about charging, but you know, it's, it's not unfamiliar to people that, uh, that looked at Enernoc or Converge uh, several years ago. Absolutely. So no, my name is Gregor Brand. I'm the uh, chairman and CEO of Nuvi. Um, we, no, we are really at the intersection between transportation and energy, right? We have a platform that <clears throat> initially was developed at the University of Delaware, which was very focused on vehicle to grid. The concept around vehicle to grid is the idea that, you know, renewable is very uh, alternative in, in the generation and therefore requires some, some storage. And the idea that uh, we at Kempton, my partner in starting Nuvi, had was that, um, you know, electric vehicles have big battery inside and, uh, and they are parked most of the time. And therefore, if you put the electronics where you have uh, not just the ability of taking energy from the grid, but also to push it back to the grid, uh, you can create really storage on wheels. And then if you had a, uh, a platform on top of that, that is a virtual power plant platform, you then can aggregate all those resources and participate across a variety of energy markets. Um, today, our platform has the ability to take vehicle to grid, you know, bidirectional vehicles, also unidirectional vehicles and stationary storage and combine them in uh, what I would qualify as a portfolio effect uh, where we're able to optimize all those resources together in order to address a variety of markets. Um, we have a platform that's usually, that's really a, a universal platform. It's working today in, in Denmark, in France, in the UK, here in California, in, in PGM, uh, in Japan as well. Uh, and, and the idea is to have a, a, a platform that is very adaptable to the different markets. You know, energy markets are very different from one place to another. And so the ability of transforming electric vehicles from a unreliable load at the end of the distribution system into a reliable, dispatchable, monetizable asset. That's really what we are about here. And working with, with, you know, with all the partners, the EV partners, the infrastructure partners, right? We, as we were described recently in an article, is we, you know, we are kind of like the last piece of the puzzle, um, though I think it should not be underestimated because integrating all those EVs on the grid, as Desmond was saying you know, just a few minutes ago, it's going to be a tremendous challenge. And it's very important to have that bridge between the electric system and the electric vehicle in order to allow all those electric vehicles to come and, and recharge themselves and fulfill the needs of the driver, which is going to be the number one priority all the time. Excellent. So the next question I wanted to ask is about um, your revenue model. What's your revenue model? How do you make money? What, one of the great things about you know, the charging market is there's so many different ways that people are approaching this. And we've got a good cross section here. So um, Lukong, do you wanna kick it off? And uh, uh, sorry, Baomin, do you wanna kick it off and, and give us the Lukong uh, revenue model, how you, uh, how you generate revenue, how you make money? Cool. So uh, we have a, a number of sources of revenue. Number one is the subscription model and per vehicle per year, per so they pay service fees, uh, especially the, the fees are much higher in uh, advanced assistant driving and especially in autonomous driving. And we have service fees for autonomous driving testing. Uh, so basically you need a lot of data uh, to make sure the autonomous driving is safe. So all those testing have generated a lot of data and we help to manage the data systems. And we have the project based generated revenues and ongoing service fees for data services and map services. And in areas that we foresee very high growth. So we are open to profit sharing model as well. So we uh, act as the provider of the technology and the platform operator, and we can share the profits and the revenue uh, based on the large growth. And we have our, uh, location-based services, and we have the advertising revenue coming from that side of the business as well. So we have revenue from those sides. Excellent, excellent. Alf, can you talk a little bit about the Ideanomics uh, revenue model, sort of how you make money, how, how, you, how you generate your revenue? Yeah, sure thing. I mean, this is, a, this is a discussion around infrastructure, so I'll stick on the charging side for the most part because we, we do have a few different revenue streams. But... Um, Essentially, there's three ways we make money in the, in, the, in the charging market right now. The first is the sale and installation of the charging equipment and the energy management systems, um, such as Wave that we've just acquired, but we are agnostic. We will 
we'll supply other types of charging as well. Um, second one is um, we supply access to a preferred charging rates to our partner networks in places like China. So we get a revenue share on that basis. Third one is we, we operate in the wholesale energy market as well for large commercial fleet operators. We, we do something called peak shaving, which means essentially we buy off peak energy demand at a discount. We sell it to our fleet customers so they can consume it at on peak hours when, when their vehicles are on the road. Um, but there's another element to this as well, which is, which is really important, which is um, data services are becoming more and more prevalent. And that's one of the reasons we made this wave acquisition. Um, tremendous amount of data in the energy management, energy consumption space. And we, we, we foresee a fourth revenue stream uh, coming out of that. And, and Wave is a very interesting one for us because you know, we're gonna be putting those panels, those charging panels on the bottom of our, on the bottom of our uh, Medici trucks and buses as well. So they're gonna come baked in with Waze technology. Excellent, excellent. Michael, can you, you can you talk a little bit about the Blink approach? I know you you you'll do what you know a variety of things that the customer wants, but can you can you describe that for everybody on the call? Yeah, our um, revenue model is is very very simple, and while we may have uh, multiple deployment models to get our hardware in the ground, um, our revenue models are are quite simple. Um, we sell the fuel that power EVs, so we make the difference between what our energy costs are and what we sell those units of energy to our consumers. And we use our charging stations as the uh, dispensers of that um, electricity. That's our main focus on how we plan on generating our, re our revenues, which we do today and, and even more so in the future. Um, in addition, we sell hardware and networking services to third parties as well. But again, our, our mainstay business and how we've developed a Blink's business model, um, literally from day one, is to provide the fuel. Um, no different than what Exxon Mobil does today. Um, it, it's, it's going out there providing the fuel for cars to travel in the most convenient locations that are accessible to them. Excellent. Um, Desmond, how do, you, how do you explain Beam's uh, revenue model? I know you've got a new emerging uh, sort of leg on the stool. So um, walk, walk us through the, the different ways you're, you're earning your revenue and you expect to earn revenue over the next few years. Well, Craig, as you said, uh, this is a very diverse uh, industry at the moment with all sorts of different business models and even hardware types uh, uh, providing the fuel to these electric vehicles that are coming. Our products, uh, we make money by selling products which are infrastructure products which support all of those models, all of those EV chargers and all of those service providers. So whether it's got two wheels, three wheels, four wheels, 18 wheels, two wings even, we just did the world's first flying on sunshine uh, test flight recently, or six rotors with our recently patented drone recharging product, we're gonna provide an infrastructure solution that gives you the EV charging or the, the, the electric uh, vehicle charging uh, of your choice, service provider or charger of your choice without any construction, without any permitting, uh, without any electrical work, you will never get a utility bill. So when Mike talks about the spread between the cost of electricity and the and the and, and what he can charge for it, in our case, there is no uh, cost for electricity. So when a blink charger is mounted on one of our products, there's zero unit cost for the energy, and we believe that's revolutionising uh, the fueling model moving forward as well. And in any type of electric vehicle, uh, frankly, we are providing a rapidly deployed uh, solution to get the uh, EV charger uh, to work. That's the that's the core of our business at the moment. So it's selling the product. However, as you pointed out, we do have a brand new uh, space that we're moving into right now. I believe this will be the highest gross profit recurring revenue business model I've ever been involved with. And I've been involved with a few doozies, by the way. Um, and that's mm -hmm. using media to fund the deployment of large networks of these infrastructure uh, products. Again, remaining agnostic to the EV uh, service provider or the EV charger provider, but, but using media to fund the infrastructure deployments in the same way that Citibank is, is heavily funded by, or, or Citibike is heavily funded by Citibank in New York City. We're just gonna have a better mousetrap, frankly, the, the driving on sunshine network brought to you by your friends at fill in the corporate, corporate blank. And we just think that's a much more profitable way to go. It allows us to do rapid deployments uh, and, and frankly, uh, revolutionize the fueling model by offering EV charging for free, free to the driver and uh, even free to the cities in which we, uh, we deploy it. So we're really excited about that. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, Citibank paid uh, 60 million to the city of New York for the, for the rights to sponsor the city bike in, in New York City, is that correct? 
Well, in 2012, they wrote a check for $48 million for the first five years. And obviously, they've renewed since that time, as, as these corporate sponsorships typically do uh, renew. And by the way, Citibank's just one, one of those models. They're, these things are, are repeated all over the place. I mean, that's why you have a Wrigley Field, I suppose, in Chicago, right? Uh, this, the chewing gum uh, uh, company originally sponsored it. Um, so it's not a new business model, um, but we have a new mousetrap, and it's highly visible. It's very attractive. And then, Craig, don't forget, it's not just the branding uh, that, the, that the sponsor gets. There's also the magnificent carbon offsets that these networks uh, uh, deliver. So you're talking about millions of pounds a year of CO2 offsets. Any corporate sponsor uh, who's looking for branding, looking to green and add sustainability to their image, but is also looking to go towards carbon neutrality in the next couple of decades and open the Wall Street Journal any day of the week, and you're going to find numerous of them that are. Uh, we're providing that, that opportunity to reduce their carbon footprint and get them this magnificent branding. So it's a total bargain for them it's a win 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 for everybody involved frankly excellent excellent moving on to gregory from nuvi so gregory you know a lot of people don't really understand the virtual power plant uh model you know we we understand you know direct sales and licensing and things like this can can you walk us through the different components of your revenue stream um and you know, Enernock and Converge, people love those companies when they were public because of sort of, sort of the software like uh, growth and margins. Um, you know, here we're kind of layering that on top of the existing EV growth. Um, can, can you maybe just sort of uh, unpack this a little bit for everybody uh, on the call today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, the, the perception very often is that, you know, vehicle to grid is about making money on what I would call the retail meter, right? Which is the meter on the site where all the vehicles are connected. Uh, in reality, um, the energy markets are layered, and, and there are many of those layers, um, and and so the, and they are very complex, right? Which is why you know we are really the, the leader on this subject today, is because we've been spending a lot of time understanding all those markets. Uh, it really starts at at um, you know, usually the, the main point is around what's called independent system operators, right? We've got Kaiso in in California, PGM, New York independent system operators. Uh, those are uh, companies that are managing the, the wholesale market, right? So uh, like generators are trading in that wholesale market. So one, the, the first implementation of, of the technology that we had done at the University of Delaware was really to participate in one of those markets called frequency regulation. The frequency regulation market is the instantaneous mismatch between demand and supply on the grid and it's a capacity market so you're not getting paid for energy going in and out of the vehicle you are just being paid for having the capacity think about spinning reserves right those are some of the categories um, and so rather than having a physical device that's spinning uh, we have those vehicles and and our focus today is is fleet vehicles right and so you have those vehicles that are there that can help participate and participate into that market. We, we've been participating in that market in Denmark for the last four and a half years now. And there we are using Nissan Leaf on 10 kilowatt interconnection. And they've been generating about $2,000 per vehicle per year of revenue. If you accumulate that over the life of the vehicle, it's about a 25% total cost of ownership reduction that we can provide uh, by, by using those vehicles while they are parked to participate into those, those, those energy markets. Now, um, there, there are many other layers of, of, of markets, right? There is also, I mean, here in California, there is a lot of demand response program. Um, and, and a lot of those demand response are based usually on the baseline consumption, uh, though we expect that to change significantly uh, in, in the near future. But now the ability of combining you know, fleet vehicles with buildings, for example, can provide a lot of value um, to those, those sites. So this would be another layer of, of revenue that, that we can provide. Our goal in terms of how we are structuring revenue have two components. Um, some of them, like the, the ISO market participation, are very merchant exposed, so they are volatile markets. Uh, on the other hand, we are also working with different utilities, and we'll, we'll do some announcements in the very near future, where we are uh, structuring our revenue more like a PPA, a flat revenue in the long, long run. Uh, and, and that's where, you know, I think in the previous panel, there was some discussion around V2G, because especially in the school bus business, right? What we can provide there is, is a way to, uh, to add more revenue on the school bus, right? Which is really the kill up of vehicle to grid um, because those school bus are parked 95% of the time. So it's easy for utilities to understand how school bus can really help them on, on their system. 
Uh, and so we are working with school bus manufacturers, with infrastructure manufacturers, with financing partners in order to go to the school districts and to provide a full transportation and energy as a service, uh, where this combination of PPA revenue on the one hand, uh, combined with volatile revenue and the transportation fee that the school districts are paying, uh, allows the, the school district to switch from internal combustion engine school buses to electric school buses uh, cost neutral, not having to pay more. Although the cost of those buses, of electric buses are a lot more upfront, we can do this conversion accounting for the charging station installation, as well as potentially the grid upgrades. We can package all of that in a finance and package over the life of the vehicle, 10 to 12 years uh, at cost neutral for the school districts. Uh, and so this combination of, of PPA revenue with volatile revenue is very attractive for investors. You know, you are looking at IR of 15 to 17% that can be provided to infrastructure investors in this case, uh, which is you know, very attractive from a, from a you know, sustainable infrastructure investment perspective. Excellent, thank you for that, Gregory. Um, so everybody's accepting the growth of EVs today and, and the long-term trajectory there. Um, Infrastructure is really different, right? You know, we think of a conventional gas station, how much technology is there? Almost nothing. And um, in uh, EV infrastructure, um, there's a lot of technology involved, not just the charge management, but all of the other software and systems that, that make this work. So now that technology has got a wider role in infrastructure, is it more your business model or the technology that's, that's driving your growth? Or are the two sort of married together and intertwined? Um, what's your view? Baumin, what, what, what do you see for Lukong? Hi, uh, we are at our core a technology company and we are the strategic priority partner uh, with Continental, Bosch, Microsoft and the others. And we just signed a deal with Beijing Automotive Industry Holding Company and to join develop the autonomous driving uh, based on our HD map. So we are the provider of the HD map to Ford for its uh, uh, advanced driver assistance system. And we are working with uh, other very well-known automakers and the tier one suppliers in helping them developing the autonomous driving technology and testing and managing their data generated by their testing. And by the way, this is a very highly regulated area and I, as you know HD map are considered a Chinese national security and has a very high uh, entry barrier and we are the one of the few major license holder that have the full set of the licenses that can operate in this space and eMapGo has developed its HD map production system since 2016 and lately it's map making a uh, production system has been upgraded and continuously enhanced by the latest uh, machine learning and the AI technologies. And by doing this, we uh, greatly improved the accuracy and production speed while the cost of producing of these maps are greatly reduced. And the integration between Luoquan super engine technology and EMAP GOAT's production system further improve this operational speed, availability, and reduce the cost. And at the core, we are a technology company, and we take pride in ourselves in developing and operating one of the most advanced uh, data processing technologies, and we have uh, 15 patents to protect our intellectual IPs. So yes, infrastructure and technology is our blood and soul. Wonderful. So Alf, Ideanomics, you guys do a few different things. Some of them, some of them I would consider almost, almost old economy, but serving the new, right? The whole sales model and sure. what you're bringing to EV sales in China. Um, but then you have some advanced technology, particularly your, your acquisition recently. Um, can, you, can you maybe talk about how these two are intertwined? And um, you know, is one driving your growth technology versus a business model um, more, more than the other right now? Yeah, look, it's an interesting question. Um, in any nascent industry, um, there's obviously a heavy technology component. I think EV is starting to become exciting for passenger cars now because the technology has become cost efficient. Year over year, the battery costs are coming down, etc. 
Uh, and I think that makes it more affordable. And that's why I think we'll see 2021 as a breakout year for, for commercial EV as well. Um, you know, for us, it's a blend of the two. Um, you know, the technology obviously gives you access to the market and then it's how you monetize it in your business model. And we think we have, you know, numerous uh, revenue streams here. Um, the really interesting revenue streams, is, as I've always said, ad nauseum on, on a lot of these panels, is, um, you know, the last, the last panel was interesting, but those guys are in the, in the vehicle space. And, you know, the vehicle space is not the big economy in EV, okay? The transition in energy demand from gasoline and diesel over to electric. And I've been banging that drum from the beginning. And, 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 uh, and most of the other guys on, on this panel here will agree with me. That's where the major market economy is. Okay. And that's where everybody's business model should be focused. And that's certainly why you see us with a number of revenue streams in the charging space, as well as, you know, our ability to sell vehicles and place financing to help people get into those, those cars and trucks. Excellent. Excellent. So Michael, one of the things I really like about Blink is um, how you've taken the long-term approach of understanding that total number of parking spaces served is a very, very important thing. It's kind of like how many gas stations of whatever it is, however many thousand we have in this country, are you serving, right? Are you ExxonMobil or are you Raceway Fuel, right? <laughs> and you've, you've understood the low tech business approach and you've brought a high tech solution to your customers. Um, to, to meet their needs for EV charging. Can you maybe talk um, a little bit about how these two things come together for Blink um, and how these shape your longer term trajectory? Yes, um, Blink is a combination of footprint land grab um, and technology. Um, obviously we're, we're fueling EVs, which is extremely high tech, but our business is really about partnering with property owners and providing in those locations on an exclusive basis EV charging services. And whether you're riding on that vehicle or riding in that vehicle or flying in that vehicle, um, our agreements incorporate any vehicle that needs to be fueled with electricity. And these are typically long-term contracts, um, somewhere between 15 and 21 years in length, where we have the exclusive rights of providing those services in those locations. And when you look at our agreements with our property owners, um, it's not based upon technology. The only time we refer to technology is that we're going to provide state of the art technology in those locations, and that we're going to make sure um, that those locations are supplied with demand. As, as more and more cars hit the marketplace, um, we will make sure that the, the demand is, is there. And in our agreements, we only refer to the, the technology in the addendums at the end of the agreement. Um, and, and that's our focus. It's really um, the combination of, of technology and, and um, um, a land grab, but, but that's our business is going out there and, and, and on exclusive basis, long-term contracts with property owners. And, and whether it's DC charging stations or, or um, level two charging stations, whether there's a solar component to it or not, um, um, our, our relationships really are, are based upon providing EV charging services uh, on an exclusive basis. And I wanna, I wanna add to what um, Alf was, was mentioning earlier. Um, you know, it, it's important to note, you know, um, when you look at history and it comes to the automobile market, 99.5% um, of uh, automobile manufacturers have gone bankrupt. And that, that's a fact, 99.5%. Um, investing in that space is, is, is statistically not in your favor. Again, there, there's definitely gonna be short-term gyrations um, you know, in, in pricing and, and you can make money trading stops. Um, but, but everyone should really be very cautious understanding historically and, and, and literally 99 and a half percent of auto manufacturers have failed. Um, on the other hand, um, whether an auto manufacturer produces a car that's powered by diesel, um, gasoline, electricity, or for that matter, for that matter, tomato sauce is not really going to change the dynamics of their business. They're selling a car, a unit. And um, if we're talking about autonomy, um, I think it's definitely a lot more impactful um, with, with auto manufacturers more so than electrification. Um, and and, and Alf is correct. The, the real value here um, is the switch over of the fuel source and who's going to benefit um, and who's going to be negatively impacted um, the most. And obviously, it's, it's, it's those that supply the gasoline of today um, that, that are going to have some problems um, unless they diversify and get into, you know, in our space. Um, uh, who, who, who benefits the most? Obviously, those that produce the power, um, those that, that generate that electricity. And Desmond, with all respect and love, you know, we do business. Someone's got to foot the cost of that infrastructure. Um, you can't say the electricity is free. Um, someone's got to pay for it. 
Um, and, and then again, that's what we do is we, we find the, the lowest uh, cost price of energy and try to get that to our EV drivers um, through the property owner partnerships that we have and through the amazing technology that Blink has developed. Um, when you look at Blink's AC charging stations um, compared to the rest of the industry, um, again, we're owners and operators. So if you look at all the other owners and operators, all the other uh, hardware vendors, none of them own and operate um, charging stations. Their business is to get you to buy more hardware for that um, hardware to be um, antiquated, obsolete, and have refresh cycles. And, and that's why all of our competitors um, on the AC chargers, they're still at 32 amps or 40 amps because they want to have these upgrade cycles. And what, what's the differentiator in, in, in AC charging or all charging stations is how fast um, that energy is going to move from the grid to that car. That's what the consumer is concerned with. I know we all have all these amazing, crazy ideas of generating money um, off, off this business, but we need to look at it from the consumer's perspective. And they just want to know is where can I plug my car in and, and get energy as cheap as possible and convenient as possible. And when we all focus on that, ultimately we'll be able to provide tremendous services um, to these users, which are our customers, the EV drivers. Excellent. Th thank you for that. So Desmond, um, maybe it would be, it would be um, good to just explain the, how, the ease of install of your product, right? Five minutes off the back end of a, of a truck with a, with a small crane and the, the ease to sort of redeploy the, the units. Um, if, if you could describe that briefly and then, you know, can you, can you say whether or not it's the deployability, the, the, the fact that you don't have to spend, you know, 2000 bucks a foot to rip up asphalt to put in your system or um, the technology involved with uh, PV charging battery, charging the car um, that's, that's allowing you to see the growth outlook that you're facing down right now. So the, the original question was, um, you know, the, 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 the business model and the, the fact is, uh, is it the technology or is it the business model? Um, yeah. Our technology is revolutionary and our business models are revolutionary as well. And our revolutionary business models are enabled by our revolutionary technology. Um, the, 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 it's, the, the world is going to need an awful lot of EV charging. And the fact is, if you look at where we fit into the competitive stack here, we're replacing a 100 year old sort of medieval model of digging up the streets, pouring concrete, getting building permits, pulling cables and all those other uh, uh, sorts of things. That's where we fit into the competitive stack. Uh, we're competing with the general contractor, the electrical contractor, all those, all those um, that ecosystem of service providers, which have been doing the same thing for over hundred years. Our technology does exactly what technology should do. We've simplified what was before a complicated and expensive and time consuming process. And I completely agree with what, with what uh, Mike just said about energy. Somebody's got to pay for it. The beauty of what we've done is we've, we've said, hey, listen, we can reduce your cost of installation and the time and effort involved in your installation to such a great extent that just offsetting those costs will allow you essentially to have free fuel uh, moving into the future, Wh whoever's charger and whoever's business model uh, you're going to. So it's the revolutionary technology which enables the revolutionary business model. Look, we're deploying in as little as four minutes. There is no crane, by the way. Uh, we're the ultimate in shovel ready projects. There is no shovel either. We just drop these things off with a specialized piece of equipment, we all, which we also have uh, developed and we sell that as well. And as little as four minutes, compare that to as much as two years in New York City to go through the entire environmental impact and permitting and, and construction and everything else process. So it's a revolution in the way infrastructure is deployed. But don't forget beyond that, this is a source of power which is immune to blackouts and brownouts. We're all looking forward to the future electrification of transportation. And I, I'm an EV driver, I'm an EV motorcycle rider, electric plane flyer and everything else. Um, we need to have a source of fuel which is not relying on the grid, uh, which is prone to blackouts and brownouts. We have a strategic petroleum reserve. Where is the strategic electric reserve? Well, our products uh, provide that as well. So it's, there's multiple revolutions going on here. And then when you look at the recurring revenue business model that we have, which again, I, I like to think of that as revolutionizing the fueling model. For a hundred years, we've all been going somewhere and watching the meter tick over and adding dollars to our credit card or to the, to, to the cash that we pay. In this case, we're using a model which is much more akin to Gmail. Okay, we're saying you, we're gonna find another way to monetize this hundred year old model and bring you rapidly deployed infrastructure and find other more innovative ways to pay for it. And that, that'll just be the beginning. We haven't by any means closed this circle. We're just opening up a whole new way of doing things. Um, and I think that's gonna be tremendously uh, successful for us. So it's not, it's not one or the other. 
It's that one enables the other. The revolutionary technology, our ability to rapidly deploy and to not have a utility bill and to survive blackouts and brownouts and to support any provider in the space, whoever they are and whatever, however they want to go about the business, that enables the business models which are replacing a 100-year-old construction uh, model, replacing the utility bill, replacing the threat and allowing for these other recurring revenue uh, business models which are not tied to unit costs of energy sold because our unit cost of energy is zero after uh, we amortize for the equipment. Excellent, th th thank you for that. Gregory, um, technology and business model is so neatly internet interlaced for Nuvi, right? The virtual power plant. So, so, so maybe, um, can you describe whether or not it's, it's what you're bringing to the utilities that's new and unique? Um, that the demand response frequency regulation capabilities with EVs. Um, lots of people have talked about it. Very few have actually done anything. You're, you, I, I believe, scaled more than anyone else in this market. Um, is it the uniqueness of what you're bringing to this archaic old utility industry, a real solution that's driving uh, the, the, this, this growth outlook that you're, that you're looking at now? Or is it the existence of the technology and what you've created um, that, that's sort of allowing this natural evolution. I mean, is it the chicken or the egg, I guess is sort of the question, but it's, you know, it's, it, you can't separate the technology and the, and, and the business model, can you? They're just neatly together in one package. I think it's, it's about the technology, it's about the business model, and it's about also the regulatory environment, right? We're evolving mm -hmm. in a highly regulated environment. Yeah. And, and from the beginning, right, the way a platform has been designed is to fit in those regulatory environment inside the platform in terms of you know, these virtual power plants, you know, as I describe it very often, right? When, when you look at, at uh, how the EV infrastructure, you know, some people like eMotor Works, so for example, were looking at it, right? They were managing the charge of EVs and then they said, hey, let's do some demand response with it. From the ground up, our platform has been designed around um, a virtual power plant that is using electric vehicle as an asset. Right, which is a very different approach because now you're building a platform where you can retrofit all those regulatory environments, account for them in how you are then using those, those electric vehicles in order to participate into those markets. Um, and, and to elevate the discussion and to kind of uh, you know, rejoin what everybody has been saying, number one thing is um, renewable energy, the cost of renewable energy in terms of the generation cost, uh, as Desmond was just saying it, is going down to zero, right? We, you know, wind generation uh, over the last 10 years uh, has been, the cost has been reduced by 90%, right? So the cost of the kilowatt hour is going one way, is going down. Now, also, you know, to some degree how Michael was describing it, it's, it's all about the energy services, right? How do you bring it from wherever it's generated to wherever it's needed in the most cost-effective way? Right? And therefore, it's about how much upgrade do you have to do to the electric system, right? And, and, and uh, to avoid that, you can do either this month solution, which is I'm not connected to the grid, or you can you know, adjust how those vehicles are interacting with the system, right? Let's look at it. Vehicles don't need all to be charged at the same time. They don't. Uh, you know, when we have traffic jam every morning on, on, on the road, it's like 25% of the vehicles that are on the road, right? 75% of those vehicles are parked at the same time. So there's always resources that are available to help keep everything balanced uh, at, at the grid level. Um, and so, uh, you know, how do we uh, uh, then, so how does your system interact with all of that? As you said, it's, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's an IoT system, right? It's, it's just an internet of things where you have a platform that's centralized that's communicating with all those devices, that's receiving input from the grid at multiple level. The complexity comes from one, how do you manage in the most optimum way all those resources, depending on where they are, right? Are you trying to provide a very local service? Maybe you're trying to do demand charge management and therefore keep the cost of energy down, right? Which is one of the services we can provide to our customers. Or are you trying to participate into a wholesale market, in which case you can use resources that are much more distributed and, and you have much more flexibility in how you are using all those resources. Now, whatever the service you are doing, it all needs to fit into a specific regulatory environment in terms of how you are doing the service and then how you need to demonstrate that you have actually performed the service you said you were going to do. Uh, and that's now, that's now the bridge between 
you know, help, you know, working with, with partners, either it's fleet uh, managers or it can be charge point operators. Um, and then how do you bridge it to the utility environment, right? Because I don't think utilities are gonna go away. The infrastructure, we all need this infrastructure. It's really about how do we optimize this infrastructure that is, is, is available today so that this does not become a hurdle in the adoption of electric vehicles. If you try to have an infrastructure that's gonna be, you know, that you have to pay for uh, something that's used at, you know, 5% of the time at max capacity, that's not affordable. So that's, that's where this, this optimization, this integration of electric vehicles into the system is so important, but following the rules that they are today and then working with different partners that we can work with. And, and at the end of the day, the way we're gonna solve this problem, there's not one solution. It's by combining you know, all the effort that we are bringing today. Uh, that's the only way we're gonna solve this problem. This is extremely complex. This is a drastic revolution. Um, and, and, uh, and yes, I think the opportunities that we are facing are gigantic. Our interaction with energy is gonna to totally change over the next 10 years. There's no more limitation in how much energy we can get if it's coming for nearly zero per kilowatt hour. It's about the services that you can provide with that. I understood that that makes a lot, a lot of sense. So the next question I wanted to ask you all, I should probably frame out a little bit, right? So a lot of the EV companies out there, I mean, Tesla is the umbrella stock. Everybody wants, you know, a Tesla like valuation, but you know, in order to justify a valuation on Tesla where it is, you have to really reach out almost to 2030. Um, either that, or you have to believe that none of their competition is real. And, you know, every car is going to be a Tesla robot in five years, which I don't know how realistic that is. Um, the reality though, is that a lot of the companies across the EV charging space face the exact same growth outlook as their peers in the EV space, um, but not, not quite the valuations. Uh, so, you know, with that probably in the back of your head, you know, people on this call probably would appreciate a discussion of, you know, what does the blue sky scenario look like when we talk about 25% EV penetration? What does that do for your company? So Baomin, what does it do for Lukong if we get to 25% EV penetration? What does the world look like for you? Okay, so electronic vehicles are more likely to be equipped with the advanced driver assistance system and at a later date, the, the full automated uh, driving assistant. So it's definitely demand a better driving experience and a higher level of safety as well. So the assistant driving and autonomous driving uh, in EVs are much easier to implement and they enjoy a, a very huge uh, comparative cost advantage in that area. And for us, we providing the HD map uh, to guard the safety of the uh, autonomous driving. You know, in severe weather and road conditions, such as very foggy, heavy rain and snowy, and it will not be entirely safe to drive only depending on the sensors uh, on the vehicle. So we, as the provider of HD map, we provide uh, centimeter level uh, precision in the lane navigation and the road sensing capability will tell you what is happening around the road, where is safe, where is not safe. So to be able to handle all weather conditions, I think the HD map will be, if not absolutely necessary, it will be a great complementary force to all the sensors on the vehicle. So it will definitely help uh, the adoption of our HD map, uh, especially the higher level HD map uh, subscription and our revenue will be very gladly be positively influenced. Additionally, uh, the EVs are most, more likely uh, to have more vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to road communications. And those data communications are going to be huge, right? And this will help drive our data services as well. All those data connected back to the system and we will use it in our map production and the map updating services. This will reduce the cost of our operation. So the uh, higher EV penetration is great news to us. We can't wait to see 
the road is all connected, vehicles are connected, and all the data will serving them a better uh, chance to have a safer and more enjoyable ride. Excellent, I, I like that. <laughs> of course. Um, Alf, what does 25% penetration of EVs do for ideonomics? What's, yeah, what's your it, blue sky? I think, you know, when we get to 25%, I think as we're starting to see in China, I think we're gonna see some consolidation around the market leaders. Um, I disagree with you, Craig, on, uh, on Tesla for one simple reason. Okay. Um, Tesla understands that the energy is the end game here. They're, they're way ahead in terms of their vehicle manufacturing costs, their charging systems, their power management. Okay, they are the apple of the automotive industry. Okay, they've got the cult following, they've got the walled garden, they've got the proprietary chargers. Okay, but just as there's an apple out there in, in, you know, in the world of mobile devices and, and computers, um, there's also an Android. Okay, I'm, I sell my own vehicles, but I'm vehicle agnostic. I'm battery agnostic. I'm charging system agnostic. Um, when it comes to the market leaders, I truly believe that Ideonomics is best positioned to be the, uh, the Android of the EV industry to Tesla's Apple. Excellent, excellent. So Michael, uh, you know, is an analogy of maybe uh, the Rex Tillerson of, uh, of, of charging uh, parking spaces, uh, one that you would, you would snap up in a 25% uh, scenario? I mean, what, what's, what's your blue sky? What do you, what do you foresee? Um, well, just I think on a personal level, on all the members on this panel, I think if we see 25% um, percent, um, EV sales, I think we're all going to be billionaires. Um, <laughs> but outside of that, you know, not on a personal level, but in regards to our businesses, um, in regards to Blink, um, what you'll see is Blink chargers everywhere. Um, in, in order to be able to, to satisfy 25% of the market being EVs, um, you will need to see um, roughly 15, 20% of every single parking lot um, having all of 20% uh, of their parking spaces um, with plugs or some sort of connectivity. Um, and, and that will allow us to um, deploy charging stations um, in locations that we currently have. So one of the things that's, that, that's really um, um, uh, part of our model is the fact that we, we provide a service and, and, and as demand increases in those locations, we have the contractual right um, to go add additional infrastructure in those locations. So, um, you know, we, we may partner with a location and put one charging station in there initially, but as more and more cars hit the market um, and we see utilization kicking up, um, we have the ability of going in there without a, a sales process. Um, and, and although it does seem like it, may, it might be um, somewhat expensive, but, you know, we're only talking a few thousand dollars um, to put a level two charging station in a location. Um, it's quite different than having to put, you know, solar panels and um, all this other infrastructure, whether it's easy to get in or not, um, the cost differential between putting, um, you know, Blink IQ 200 with 19.2 um, kilowatts of output into locations for about five or $6,000, um, that really allows us to, to, to gain a, a massive footprint. So seeing that massive amount of, of, of a percentage of sales being, uh, of EVs being 25%, um, you, you, would, you would very um, clearly see that um, visually um, as you walk through any um, major urban city and you would see Blink's name um, plastered everywhere. Excellent, excellent. So Desmond, I, I, I'll share my version. Now you can, you, I mean, then you, you layer yours on top. I, 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 you know, in a 25% scenario, I kind of love this idea of, of, a, of a station that takes four minutes, you said to deploy, four or five minutes, and then you can redeploy it, right? I mean, moving the charge stations from the beach uh, uh, to uh, the shopping centers and, you know, once summer's over and uh, deploying for them for sports games. I mean, it, it sounds like something that would have a real ROI. What's your vision on this, on this uh, you know, 25% um, EV penetration scenario? What, what would that really mean for, for Beam? I said everybody on this panel uh, is shooting at the right target, and it's a bloody gigantic target. Uh, there, there are about 1.4 billion cars on the world's roads today, moving to 2 billion by 2035, and they're all going to be electric. There's no question about that. Um, that means the world's going to need hundreds of millions of publicly available EV chargers. Forget charging at home. That works for people like me and perhaps the other panelists that you know have single family residences and, and a garage and available circuit to do that. 
All right, most other people are not going to be able to charge everyone. They're going to have to charge in public uh, environments, and that's what we're all uh, aiming towards. Ne never mind fleets and everything else. There is not enough power on the U.S. grid or on the global grid to support the electrification of transportation today. Okay, we're going to need a. I mean, Elon Musk just recently said double the capacity that's on the global grid to to support the electrification of transportation today. And anybody that knows anything about building power stations and electric grids and all that sort of stuff knows that in the next couple of decades, there's no way that's happening. We have the fastest deployed, most scalable, and lowest total cost of ownership uh, solution for infrastructure to support all this EV charging. And it works anywhere it can see the sky. So for, to the point about the cost around this, we're already deployed in over 100 municipalities and we're deployed uh, internationally as well. Nobody deployed our product because it was cheaper to dig up the streets and to, and to pour the concrete and to do the trenching and all that sort of stuff. Nobody did that. They all did it because it's less expensive from a construction and, and, and engineering point of view to put the charging where people want, it, want the chargers, not where circuits available. Um, and also because uh, from a longer term point of view with the utility bills and everything else, electricity is only going to get more expensive. And so is the construction and permitting process only going to get more expensive. Look at where we are, though. We're in the manufacturing business. The more of this we do, the cheaper it gets for us to do it. Solar prices plummeting, battery prices plummeting. All of our products have batteries, by the way. They all work day or night during periods of inclement weather and everything else like that. All of the cost inputs for our products plummeting, volume increasing. Like any other manufacturing business, you're going to see the cost of our products coming down. And in our wildest dreams, we will never scratch the tip of the tip of the iceberg of global demand, the hundreds of millions of charges that will need to be deployed in the future. But even the tip of the tip of the iceberg puts us a billion dollars plus of revenue. Perfect. Okay. Unfortunately, we're very short on time. So, Gregory, um, we have like a minute and a half, and I, I want yeah. to have just 10 seconds myself at the end. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I think the way the way I want to close it, the way I know 25%, what does it mean? Today we are providing a full turnkey solution between the charging station, the vehicles, we have you no know, strong relationship across all that ecosystem. At 25%, right, we can move into what is truly the business model of Nuvi, which is to provide those energy services to become basically the visa of the MasterCard of the energy transactions around electric vehicles, either it's to charge them or to provide great services. Uh, and 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 you know, being that piece that helps bridging, combining, and avoiding having all those, those costs from a great perspective uh, by, by uh, you know, providing those great services. And that's really, really the vision of the companies to become, you know, again, this Visa MasterCard of the energy transaction for electric vehicles. And at 25% uh, market penetration, we are right there. Excellent. Thank you all for a very lively discussion, a lively conversation. I think anyone that, that listened today will completely understand why I'm so excited about this market. What I would say is please, anyone on the line, reach out to the investor relations contacts of these different companies if you, if you have questions for them or would like to follow up and get more information. And obviously clients and investors, um, you're welcome to, uh, to reach out to me. Thank you so much to our partners um, at Force, Harvey. Um, really appreciate your help getting this uh, together. Um, our Just pleasure. To pass, to pass this along for our, for our last comment, um, did, did, did you want to make a closing comment real quick? Well, uh, on this panel, I just think fantastic job. I mean, we all know that this is the next great gold rush, and I'm so looking forward to seeing how it develops and uh, really interested uh, in, in the different technologies that are being deployed here. So we really appreciate everybody taking the time to do this and uh, everyone who's been involved in this. And now stick around because I do believe we do have a short conversation with the folks at Arkimoto on uh, their uh, new technology and what micro mobility will mean as well. So. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Harvey.